guys, this is Wayne Conger. I'm the founder and CEO of Huts. Um, I'm happy to be joined today with Anthony Averbeck, um, a architect and urban designer and, uh, and researcher and scholar um, who thinks a lot about housing and their relationship to small towns and their different formats across the country. And so um, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks so much for having me, Wayne. It's great to yeah. be here. For sure. So, you know, as part of this homework series, we think a lot about how our huts projects fit within the larger kind of housing context. And that can mean mm -hmm. anything from financing to design to um, to how they're used. But I think what I wanted to focus on today is really um, this notion of place that every house yep. is sort of part of a community and every house um, is really sort of a platform where people are engaged in everything that's around that house. And so often with our HUTS clients, uh, particularly if they're New Yorkers or we're working, say, in, uh, on, the, on their house in the Catskills or in the Hudson Valley or in the Berkshires, there's this notion of like, I want a place where I can escape the city. I want to go to somewhere. And sometimes there can be uh, a bit of an agnostic uh, perception of where that somewhere is, and um, mm -hmm. what we always try to impress on our uh, on our clients or customers is that every one of these small towns has very different flavors and very different cultures and very different sort of places that you're inserting yourself in, and they understand themselves, and you yep. will understand yourself not just as somewhere outside of the city, but instead as part of this. Um, this uh this specific place that you chose to be a uh, participant in um and so i know this is <laughs> yeah. something that you've thought a lot about not just in the areas that i mentioned but really all across the country in the kind of small towns that really make up the fabric of, of the united states um, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about your research into this space and um, um some of how you think housing fits into it sure um i'd love to um so i really started looking at housing as an architect and urban designer, right, um, at the scale of the city, right? So I was looking at collective housing, multifamily housing. And this was all following the narrative that uh, growth uh, is moving toward uh, the urban, right? Toward uh, a select few global cities, right? And that's where everything's happening. But I, I sort of struggled to negotiate that with my own background in the American Midwest, right? And coming from a small town myself, um, that my grandfather was the mayor of, you know, and my family was deeply embedded in, uh, in northern Minnesota. Um, and so I started to ask, well, how do architects and designers start to look at housing uh, sort of beyond the city, right? Um, how do we look beyond the scope of, of urban centers and ask the question, how did people in this country begin to lay down roots? How did they begin to set up settlements and build homes, right? And it certainly was far from urban. Right. So when I came to Harvard, I started to take a deep dive into the history of the American landscape and American space. Right. Uh, and so I took courses from Professor John Stilgo, um, uh, among others, who, you know, was a disciple of J.B. Jackson. Right. One of the most uh, important American landscape historians um, who started to reinvigorate a substantial study into the history of place in this country. Right. Looking at the origins of American settlement uh, and how this country was really uh, begun as an agrarian country, right? With mercantile cities that serviced agrarian land, right? People came to this country to farm. And, and most uh, European immigrants to this country initially uh, were from small towns and agrarian places. And that's exactly what they established in this country. You know, you look at towns like Concord and Massachusetts. Uh, pretty close to where I am in, in Cambridge, right? Uh, and it very much follows the old English sort of model of meets and bounds and, you know, the town organized around the town mm -hmm. square, right? Um, and Main Street, uh, you know, has a certain requisite density, but then very quickly gives way uh, to trees and, and farmland, right? Um, so that history, tracing that history uh, from sort of initial colonial settlement to Jefferson's dream, right, of the human farmer, right, which, you know, developed a very physical imprint on this country, right, with the public land survey system, 
right? And I started to realize, actually, that the whole DNA of this country was ultimately rural. And so I started to realize, you know, that we were we were thinking of things a little bit in reverse, right? Um, by thinking of cities first uh, and then the rural as subservient to cities. I started to realize, well, actually, in this country, it's the other way. And it always has been. Yeah, it's interesting that even the 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 nomenclature of spaces is always sort of in reference to the city that it goes from the urban to the suburban to the exurban and then sort of like the hinterlands in some other place and really it's almost the, yep. the the exact opposite that you have these sort of um destinations that people look look to set up and homestead for any number of reasons there's spots that are folks uh, chose to lay down roots because the the soil sort of demanded it. You couldn't go f- much further and you, without recognizing that this was going to be an incredible fertile place to, you know, the kind of things that we see um, from like the Oregon Trail where people just didn't get any further. And that's where they stopped. And that became a spot where they started to, to scrape it through and make a place of it. Um, yeah. And what's interesting yeah. sort of t- today is that the, the spaces remain and the organization of these of small towns and, and rural places exist, but the reasons for heading there are quite different. Um, and the reasons that you might choose to be there um, are quite different. What do you find are some of the some of the criteria for choice that people are utilizing to to decide the places that they participate in? Yeah, so so that's a great question. Um, so you're right, right? Like it's almost episodic in how um places were chosen in this country, right? So to begin with, it was absolutely proximity to resources, but also proximity to the town, uh, really to the meeting hall, which was the church and the government, right, in one. Um, and so that actually informed the size and scale of the town once once sort of settlement grew so far that, you know, it was more than a 30-minute uh, commute into the town. Then, you know, they picked up roots and, and established a new town, right? Um, then it was very much following infrastructure and and towns grew and they died and they competed for uh county seat status and power and right uh and prominence um and then you know into uh you know sort of the the suburbanization and you know modern era once cities grew and it sort of became more about um you know kind of resale value and you know i want to live close enough to the major city um, but I see my home as an investment to today, you know, what I think is really driving uh, where people choose to live uh, outside of cities uh, is being close enough to a major city so that one can still be physically connected to cultural amenities, right? Um, to ball games and theater and restaurants and all that, right? But to be in a rural place, right, that is completely outside uh, of the urban uh, sort of concentric rings, right? Not suburban, but a distinctive town, right? And that's places like Hudson, New York, right, is a really good example. It's one of the fastest growing zip codes during the pandemic. And so what I found is that the, the small towns that are growing the most have a couple of characteristics. One is their proximity to major cities, right? Two is their uh, sort of geotourism draw, right? So what about it in terms of, does it have a lake? Does it have proximity to a national park? So, you know, there, there are sort of anomalous conditions, but, you know, the, the towns that are growing, uh, those are the two main, main ingredients. Yeah, I mean, I think that the argument, the argument against the suburban model and suburbanization generally that it sort of flattens out every place into being the same and there's massive homogeneity and it doesn't really matter which co- collection of car washes plus RVs plus Wendy's you live next to, it's always going to be the same. And then it's sort of, you have these other factors like, well, this one has a marginally better school district than the other, or this one um, is maybe 10 minutes closer to the big city that it's near than this other one. And that all impacts people's framing of their house as sort of their primary investment and, and incrementally shifts resale value and perceptions of like how how valuable is this place to me but i think Mm -hmm. like you're saying this sort of this kind of geotourism thing another way to think about that is just there's sort of an imaginary that's like kind of a collective imaginary about these places that's formed from different 
characteristics. So, you know, like the Hudson River School is incredibly powerful even today in framing this, these destinations and saying, you know, when you go to Catskill, Absolutely. New York, and you say, I'm looking at the same exact view over the Hudson um, that was sort of painted for um, in, in 1850. And even then, uh, in the Hudson River School is an idealized notion of of the rural um, because like in those paintings, yeah. they would remove the uh, like the, the railroad going by and they would sort of edit out all the things that seemed like they were part of industry or part of modernization. Mm -hmm. I think you're getting to a really good point where it's like, what is that? There's some sort of Venn diagram between the places that feel like they're holding on to that sort of idealistic view of ruralism, whatever we mean that to be yeah. along with proximity. It's actually, it, it's it's funny we talk to a lot of folks at huts where you know they have this idea of like well i kind of want to get out there i want to be away from all of it sort of like thoreau and then i sort of laugh and it's like yeah i mean thoreau had a little cabin in walden pond but his mom was bringing his laundry right. over and so he really wasn't like out there that's and right. i think and i think that that yeah that's not a that none of that's a bad thing but it is recognizing that it's not just like in the middle of nowhere. It's about sort of the small town where you have both of those things. You have sort of you're on that edge of sort of like the great the great wild and you have sort of a high street. I think it's one of the reasons places like yep. Livingston Manor are so uh, are so in demand is that when you go to Livingston Manor in Sullivan County in New York, you're sort of on one side kind of very, very close to highways, you have a high street, but then you know you're right on the edge of the Catskill Park, and then it's sort of endless acres of of wildness. And I think, um, yeah, it's somewhere where those two meet seems to be really, yeah. really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's really well said. You know, it's the DNA of small towns is interesting. You know, can you even call it urban? Um, I don't know. You know, it's why I, I sort of started to devise new terminology when talking about mm. small towns. I, I talk about like a townscape, right? What is a townscape versus a cityscape, right? Um, we can certainly talk about urban characteristics of small towns, right? They have main streets that have blocks and that have a certain density to them, right? And usually multi-story buildings um, that technically, you know, follow like Kevin Lynch's definition, of what a city is, right? There are lines, there are points, there are nodes, there are landmarks, you know. Um, but it's exactly what you're getting at, right? Unlike cities with small towns, there's this kind of blurry distinction between what is natural and what is human, right? Between what is the town and what is the countryside, right? And usually Main Street exists at this at this intersection, right? At this kind of, you know, this transitional zone, right, that is really difficult to even define uh, in sort of standard urban design terms. And that for me really, you know, in speaking with John Stilgo, we sort of came to the conclusion that, you know, does it even belong in the discourse of urban design or, or do we really need to talk about small towns as their own distinctive entities, right? deserving of study on their own right, you know, for what they actually are, um, because hardly anyone's actually done it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Right? Like, like Ron Coolhouse had his little foray into the countryside, right? Yeah. But very much sort of voyeuristic, right? Very right. much sort of um, almost attempting to defend the rural-urban binary, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's urban and then there's everything else, and the rural is everything else. Right. And it's this kind of, you know, this wild place of, uh, you know, of, of server farms and, and 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 sort of technological innovation in farming. And right. Right. This kind of fetishization of this of this weird place that, um, you know, that, that that doesn't even deserve to be studied for for its prehistory or, you know, its defining characteristics. Um, so part of my work is really advocacy. Right. In that small towns are distinctive entities and deserve study as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's that's really interesting. That's like you can't just kind of scale down the the logic of cities and say this is sort of a small version of that. And where cities sort of understand yeah. themselves as what sort of major industry popped up around them and their contribution to 
um, their national and the international, inter, their national GDP and the international sort of economic system. And they sort of understand themselves by their, their civic contributions and the size of their opera houses. That's just never going to be mm-hmm. the tools of understanding what makes a small town its own unique place. You have to use very different That's criteria right. to sort of understand what makes that place, um, a unique place and different from not just like a small town, but a specific location. What what do you think some of those markers are? How do you think Mm -hmm. a small town becomes or, you know, they all have their own prehistory. They all have their ways that they've sort of grown up. And a lot of them um, lean on celebrating their their origin story. But going into the future Mm -hmm. as sort of small towns are sort of rethought, reimagined, um, uh, have different sort of participants in them. What do you think the markers of place are going to be going forward? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. You know, and it it kind of gets at you know Patrick Geddes and Lewis Mumford's discussion of regionalism, right? Which which really sets up a strong argument for understanding these places based on resource extraction, right? Mm-hmm. So are they farming towns? Are they coal mining towns? Are they um, you know, oil towns. So that has been, in almost all cases, the defining characteristic to date, Mm -hmm. right? Going forward, those categories obviously become less and less important, right? Because let's, you know, let's be honest, these small towns in Nebraska or Iowa are not really servicing the agricultural production um, nearby anymore, right? These are sort of Massive corporate farms. Yeah, you're not going to you're you're not going to the town square market with your soy yield um, when you have when you have a you know a billion tons coming out. There's totally different markets for where this stuff is going to go. Exactly. Yep. So so really, what what we're starting to see is that those characteristics, like the grain elevator, right, is now being almost transformed or translated from its original purpose, right, into a sort of cultural marker, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Some of these towns in in the Midwest, the grain elevator has become, uh, you know, both a landmark, uh, a a sort of discernible point uh, in the landscape that says, there's that town, right? Um, You know, some of them are painted with murals, right? Mm -hmm. But also in some cases, a civic space. You know, there's one town in Iowa where the grain elevator elevator has become an art gallery, right? There's another where it's become uh, almost not the city hall, but the kind of meeting, uh, the meeting house, right, for for town meetings. These defining characteristics, whether they're geographic or built, right, um, these are almost being reappropriated, right, into new cultural markers that remember the past, right? Because the past is critical. The past gives the town its character, but now, obviously, the economic basis is different. It's tourism, it's remote workers, right? And it's people who haven't lived in these towns for very long. Mm-hmm. And they don't have the sort of generational attachment to these places. But as you said earlier, they have a deep appreciation for what these places have to offer, right? And they have a commitment that's as strong, I would, I would argue, um, as people who've lived there for generations to really make it, uh, a thriving place. Right. I was going to say, I think one of the really interesting yeah, cultural, ahead. cultural distinctions between, well, you know, I, I live in New York and I've lived in New York a very long time. And when mm-hmm. people who are kind of just getting started or just coming out of college say, Hey, should I move to New York? And it's like, Maybe, but it it depends. Is your cultural milieu a hundred percent about competition? If it is, yeah, this is yeah. that's a good spot. Um, but if it's about expression, if it's about if it's about creativity, and it's about being sort of unhindered in doing that, that's a very bad place for that because the 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 barriers to entry are enormous. And so, mm-hmm. I think one of the really Agreed. interesting distinctions between small towns and kind of rural places and the opportunity for them is because it, is that I think that because by by nature they're going to be somewhat less expensive, competition isn't sort of intrinsically baked into the DNA of it. You're not clamoring over people to just sort of get a breath. Um, 
I think it's quite, I think it's quite liberating for all the things that we traditionally have looked at as cities of being the hotbed for. It's like, oh, cities where like the creative people happen and cities is where like interesting innovations happen. It's like, I don't know, under daily duress of just being able to like keep the (laughs) lights on. I'm not sure that really leaves much space for, for exploration. And I think that. Um, the future of the yep. kind of small town may be that it's the it's the perfect infrastructure where um, all the cool ideas are going to come from. Absolutely. No, I mean, you, you hit on a lot of key points, right? So, you know, obviously remote work um, and our increasing uh, or, or rather our decreasing reliance on physical proximity to where we work um, and the people who we interact with is taking the pressure off of centralization, Right. So it's making these towns viable, right? It, it, it's it's viable to to live four hours away. So that's sort of opened up this new territory, as you say, right, of affordable land, uh, of places in which one can still remain connected, um, but almost carve out your own niche in a place that there isn't the sort of um, oversaturation or hyper competition, right? Um, for attention and for, uh, you know, uh, for, for real estate and for, you know, menial uh, resources. Really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, like I totally agree with you. I think, I think if one really wants to follow the proverbial American dream, so to speak, right. Um, Mm -hmm. and carve out your own space, right. Um, and your own identity, and really pursue your dreams. Some of the best places to do that are well outside of central cities, right? Where where there's the space, there's there's the time, there's the 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 pace of life, right? Um, that enables one to do that in a way that is productive and that is healthy, um, and that is just distinctly fundamentally different from doing so in New York City. Big cities had traditionally been a place for people who had a tolerance for speed, acceleration, activity, hecticness, um, and sort of thrived in that environment. And so they needed to go there to feel that. But what's interesting is that the, the world of the internet has outpaced any speed that any physical city could ever deliver. And so if that is sort of your, if that is sort of the way that you're wired and that's the wavelength that you run on, you know, getting honked out in the street actually feels quite slow compared to the pace you can choose to engage in, in, uh, on online. And so I think so much of what Mm -hmm. I hear from a lot of our, um, our clients and folks that we talk, talk to, it's not just that it's not that they're looking to get away from it all at all. They're actually looking to stay quite plugged in and they do that through, remote work, online, all of those things, and they get plenty of speed there. It's that when they are not doing that, they want a real sort of dichotomy between them. That's sort of like it's on or off. And that's, you know, it, it, it it's kind of a recent um, <laughs> uh, development that is only improving, right, as we know. It's really interesting to sort of speculate. And one almost has to think, right, that the shift, the massive growth of American cities is going to reverse, right? That what you're actually going to start to see is not suburbanization again, right? But decentralization sort of in, in a, in a way that we haven't seen in a very long time. So right. that makes, you know, it, it really opens up frankly, 94% of the land mass. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if one looks at a map of the United States, you know, yeah, cities and and uh, and their suburbs take up just over half the population, but they're like ten percent uh, of the land mass. You know, mm-hmm. so what what we're actually talking about here is almost a new frontier uh, that that is just beyond um, what so many of us are familiar with, right? And and obviously, you know, things like high speed rail and there, there are all kinds of discussions about how infrastructure, physical infrastructure, will open these spaces up, right? Um, but I think what's what's most exciting is is just what you talk about—that ability to sort of um, plug in 
uh, to culture, to plug into business and, you know, and work, um, and then, uh, uh, virtually, right. And then turn it off, right. Mm -hmm. And be in, be in a completely different place. That's already enabled, right? Like, yeah, physical infrastructure can make that a little bit easier, right? Um, but we already sort of have the tools to be able to do this, right? And that's why you're starting to see some of these towns, as I said earlier, right, that are, that are most proximal, uh, to major metropolitan areas already start to see a major influx, um, uh, of people who are, you know, not just interested in visiting these places, but laying down roots, right? Building homes. I think it's, you know, I think one of the things we'll start to see down the line in the same way, the language of gentrification that you saw in and that you see in cities and sort of like undiscovered neighborhoods, I think is going to start to apply to and maybe already does a lot of these very sought after towns that have the exact qualities that that we're talking about. And, um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see a rise of NIMBYism and NIMBY stuff and all kinds of debates around what the future land use is when a small town kind of ceases to be so small and it's starting to absorb folks. And the exact reason someone might have moved there all of a sudden is getting usurped by, um, uh, by, uh, population influx. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah. One what one last topic I wanted to hit in. What's the space of sort of new construction? What's the what, what's the role of sort of new housing stock or new building types that sort of get introduced into uh into these locations? And and maybe I guess my question is what role do you think that mm -hmm. they um need to adhere to to either like bolster the qualities of the of the small town as it is? Um but also help it evolve and not treat it as sort of, um, you know, small town land at an yep. Epcot center. Like how does it become, yep. how does it continue to be evolve and be a real place? Uh, as a start, right? Like we have to acknowledge the role of new urbanism in this conversation, right? Uh, Dwayne and Plater's Iberg and, you know, Seaside Florida, and these attempts to build small towns from scratch mm -hmm. generally don't create very vibrant places. Sure. Right. It's, it's the sort of Disneyfication of the small town, right? So that's what we have to be really careful about, right? Is, is keeping the sort of qualities of, uh, of a town that maybe Jane Jacobs would say were, were pretty good, right? So what actually becomes really important is that small town planners, uh, are given a prominent voice at the table. Right. So a really interesting project uh, underway is the Strong Towns Initiative that was started by a guy named Charles Marone in Minnesota. He's a small town planner um, who wrote a book and started a nonprofit really advocating for um, the increased role of planning. Right. In thinking about small town growth. Right. Rather than just sort of managing decline. How do you think about growth, mm. right? How do you think about in, on the one hand, reversing the effects of urban renewal, which did in fact uh, affect a lot of towns, just like cities, right? Um, where older buildings were demoed, right? To create way for more parking lots, right? So one thing that new construction can do in small towns is fill in the gaps, right? You have a downtown, you can thicken that downtown, right? You can make it uh, more dense. You can sort of fill in parking lots, right? And make that small high street, you know, um, an even more urban uh, space, right? Um, and another thing that one can do in small towns um, is to extend the grid, right? Build more housing, but don't build it in a suburban manner, right? Where you have a sort of subdevelopment. But can we think about new ways to sort of grow within the grid, right? Um, of the town itself. Um, so that, you know, you're, you're maintaining a certain um, superstructure, if you will, right? The kind of framework, the DNA of the town, but you're just thickening it. I, I think what's important in this is that there's a space for small towns to evolve without losing their character. And it, exactly. it's it, small towns don't need to be frozen in time in 
a <laughs> Uh, a sort of like idealized vision of what it might have been in 1950 when someone was kind of drinking a, a root beer along the street. Like it had, it's allowed to become something yep. new and doesn't necessarily undermine the qualities that make it appealing and charming. Um, and I think in concert with really great kind of town planning board regulation and like the right type of, um, the right type of land use um, regulation that finds a balance between increasing tax base, diversifying economic opportunities, attracting new types of folks through tax incentives or other, while at the same time mm-hmm. caring deeply about about preservation, but not having that be stuck in the stuck in the mud forever. I think is yeah. going to be one of the challenges that um, is going to be addressed between designers and regulators. Over time, like how do we yeah. find that mix that allows um, a space for things to evolve and not have it be well? It's not going to change or it dies. Like that can't be the paradigm. It has to. It, it has exactly. to. These places have to retain their DNA, utilize mm-hmm. themselves as sort of a scaffolding for growth over time, and then sort of get filled in yeah. in, appro- in appropriate ways. Um, and I think that's a really exciting, exciting future. And I'm I'm excited that um, really smart people like you are researching that and thinking about that. And um, we're hoping to have some sort of role in participating in creating some of these these places and um, improving the the outcomes of the future of the small town and 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 not um, kind of keeping them stuck and also not changing their their inherent characteristics. Oh, mm-hmm. Anthony, th- mm-hmm. thank you so much for for joining. Absolutely. And um, while we're here, maybe you can just tell us a little bit around what you have kind of coming up and things that you're working on next. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much, Wayne. I really enjoyed the conversation. I uh, look forward to uh, many to come. Um, so, yeah. So at, at the moment, I'm doing some pretty exciting research, um, both at Harvard and I'm teaching at Northeastern um, courses on housing. Um, and also sort of looking at um, working toward publishing a book on um, on my research into American small towns. So I, I'm really looking forward to uh, releasing that and 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 continuing the the conversation on these places that I think are incredibly important um, and sadly understudied. Great. Well, I'm glad I'm glad we have you looking into it, and we'll definitely keep close in touch. Um, Anthony, thank you so much, and have a have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much, Wayne. See ya.